Well, hey, what's up, Riverpoint.tv? My name's Terrence Clayton. I'm the online campus pastor. I want to welcome everyone that's joining us from all over the place, especially my friends right here in the Fort Bend County area. Well, we've got a great day planned for you. We have been talking for the last few weeks about uh, a family band, and we know some of the greatest bands that have been put together have been put together by families. So we got a great day. So sit back, relax, and uh, we'll see you in just a few minutes. Let's go ahead and put our hands together. Let's sing together, give her every breath. Give her of every breath that breathe, author of all eternity. Give her of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Make her of heaven and of earth. No one can comprehend your worth King over all the universe To you be the glory Let's Sing, I'm alive And I'm alive because I'm alive in you And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ Covers me, erases dead man's life And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive I'm alive Alright, let's keep those hands clapping A giver of every breath I breathe Author of all eternity, a giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Sing, maker of heaven, a maker of heaven and of earth, and no one can comprehend your worth. A king over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I'm alive because I'm alive in you. So sing it out. And it covers me, erases dead man's life. And it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. now join us. My name is Terrence Clayton. I'm the online campus pastor. On the right side of the page there is a welcome card. I want to invite you to fill that out. 
What it does is gives us a chance to connect with you. Also, there's a prayer request tab. You can click that and submit that in. And there's uh, people on the prayer team that would love to pray for you. Well, we got some more songs, and then you're going to hear a great message from our senior pastor, Patrick Kelly. And I'll see you in just a few minutes. My name is Karen Vaughn. I've been attending River Point Church since about 2008. I'm here today because I want to share a very important event coming up in our lives. On October the 18th of this year, my husband Ed Vaughn and I will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. He's my best friend. <clears throat> he comforts me when I'm sad, when I'm afraid. When I'm scared, he's the first person I want. He's been an excellent provider and encourager to me. And I have enjoyed all of the many things that we've done over the last 50 years together as husband and wife. We started out as newlyweds. We became parents, in-laws when our son married, and most importantly then, we became grandparents to two very special grandsons, Carter and Cody. It means so much to me to see the love that Ed not only has for me, but the love he's had and shares with his family. Going to breakfast every Thursday morning with his grandsons, giving them walk around money, TCU games, all of that is very special. And I'm proud of the relationship that Ed has had from a husband to a father to a grandfather. It makes me very proud to call him my husband. And we'll have joy in our heart because God is leading us as we go through our life, continued life together. As I think about our anniversary coming up, Ed, I just want you to know I love you so very much and I wish you from the deepest part of my heart a happy 50th wedding anniversary. Is that amazing? <laughs> Woo! Incredible! But wait, it gets better. This is amazing. Now that's actual color footage from their actual wedding, which were you very wealthy or something? How did you get that 50 years ago? Just happened to know somebody with a color camera or a recorder and re that is their actual footage. Well, here's what's amazing. Months ago, Ed came to me and said, <laughs> I'd really like to surprise Karen with this amazing gift. And I go, oh my gosh, are you kidding? I wanted to say, you know, funny, Karen said the same thing. But I did not give it away. And I said, really, Ed, what do you want to do? And he told me about this gift he wanted to give his wife for their 50th wedding anniversary. It's amazing. And I said, could we please share that with the church? It would encourage all of us husbands and all of us to be better husbands and to build strong families. Could we? So unbeknownst to Karen... Ed has been working with us to provide this amazing gift for their 50th wedding anniversary. Let me share it with you now. Here's Ed's version. Hi, I'm happy 50th anniversary. Not too often do two ordinary people get a chance and then do something great. Well, honey, we did something great. We made 50 years of marriage. I guess it's great in that it's becoming so rare these days. It's a benchmark, all right, in a marriage, but why wouldn't we stay married? We're so much in love. Well, over the last 50 years, I've given you many gifts and a lot of surprises. From a hope chest, a dog, Savorsky crystal, diamonds, birthstones, pearls, other jewelry, with you, I always wanted a gift to be so special. Karen, one of the gifts I have for you on this special anniversary may be the most unusual gift I've ever given you. Honey, I've totally stepped outside the box on this one. This gift is unusual and may not be on par with the quality of the other gifts I've ever given you. I can tell you, though, that this gift has more love, thought, meaning, and preparation behind it than any gift I've ever given you. I've known you for over 54 years, and not once 
in that time have I sung in front of you? I've picked out three songs to sing, and they all have special meaning. We would not have made 50 years without God's blessing and grace. We always wanted our marriage to work, and we always wanted to try and be a part of his plan. So the first song is How Great Thou Art, to praise him for making all of this happen. For some strange reason, Karen, I thought three songs would be nice, but little did I realize just how difficult it would be to actually pull this off. Honey, I have no visions of being a good singer. And when you hear me sing, you'll agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> My new goal is to sing one complete song in the same key. I don't know if that'll <laughs> ever happen. I did find out that it is very difficult to stay in key with your knees shaking all the time. But honey, I did want to stretch myself, just as another token of my love to you. That love and God's gentle hand got me through all of this. I can't wait to tell you about all the adventure of putting this together. From renting a recording stu studio, to getting stopped by the police, to moving my lips but no sound coming out, to just being plain scared of the process. I just wanted to let you know that even after 50 years of marriage, I still want to try and do something for you that you wanted me to do for all those years. I'm a lucky man, Karen, that both you and God chose me. I love you so much. stand up and sing that song together. Yeah. 
how great Thou art, how great Thou art, when Christ shall come, with shouts of acclamation, and take I feel my heart Then I shall This is a time in our service where it gives you a chance to participate. It's the offering time. On the right side of the page, there is an online giving tab. It's a safe, a secure place for you to give to the mission of River Point. And many of you have already done that. And we thank you so much for your generosity. Your generosity makes things like riverpoint.tv happen. So thank you so much. Well, you're going to hear one more song and then you're going to hear from our senior pastor, Patrick Kelly, as he talks about this family band.
family band, the longest bumper in every ser any series we've ever done. How great is that, huh? Hey, I hope you're enjoying this. We're extending the family band series one more week to next week. There's just so much more that we want to say. And so I'm really excited about that. Uh, welcome to River Point. My name is Patrick. If you're watching online, I know my mom always watches. So hi, mom. Uh, she said the frost is going to start any day now. And we don't like that here in Houston, okay? And uh, welcome, mom. I'm glad you're watching. If you're watching on riverpoint.tv and all those great folks at Elkins High School at our Missouri City campus, continue, please, to invite your friends and neighbors to try Elkins High School for church. It's great. Go by and see Scott Denton today. If you're uh, visiting, we, he'd love to meet you. He's not a scary guy at all. He's really nice, uh, and he'll help you up. So go by and say hi to him. Well, we've been talking about a lot of different things, and one of the questions I get a lot, especially when you're ch from parents who have teenagers, is how do you, how do you get your kids to get it? I mean, that's really the question, right? I mean, how do you get your kids to get it? And of course, I say you beat them. No, you don't. No, teenagers. No, that's not, you can't be the right answers. How do you get your kids to get it? How do you get them to really understand what a relationship with God is really all about? How do you spiritually invest in your kids? Now, how do you spiritually invest in anybody, really? And then how do you make that application with your kids? Because here's what we want. I know. This is what I want as a parent. I'm a parent of four, and I want a better way, for, I want a better life for my children than I had, and I had a good life. I want them to, to, to avert some of the mistakes I had, and I want them to experience success that I didn't have at an earlier age than I did, all those things. We all want something better for the next generation than we have for ourselves. I don't know why we're built that way, but we are. And we want our kids, for the most part, regardless of what we believe, this is what I believe is true. I cannot back this up, by the way. But here's what I believe. Even if we do not really have much of a faith in God at all, we want our children to have a vibrant faith in God. I think it's a parenting principle. Maybe it'll keep them out of trouble. You know, somehow if they believe God and follow God and believe in Jesus, that they won't smoke pot or something. You know, we don't really, we don't know really why we want it, but we want that. I want that. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor all, the li all my uh, kids' lives. I've never known me not to be a pastor. And uh, I, I, I like my walk with God. I feel like I'm growing. I've certainly grown in the last uh, 22 years that I've had children. But, but I want more for my kids. I want my kids to get it. And here's the frustration. The frustration is you cannot pass down your faith. You can pass down your religious traditions. You can pass down your denomination. You can pass down your theological your, uh, insights or your intellect or your principles. You can, you can pass down so many things, but you cannot pass down your faith. You just can't do it. Every single person sitting here at Elkins online, everybody that hears my voice right now, has to decide for themselves what they believe. And parents want... We want to make our kids believe, but they have a will of their own, right? Do any of you have teenagers? I mean, seriously. I mean, you get this will early. When the kids are two and three and four, you understand, oh, my gosh, you don't have to teach a kid to disobey. It just is natural. But you do have to teach the children to obey. You know, there's this sin nature that becomes very obvious and evident in everybody. So how do we get our kids to swallow the gospel pill? How do we get them to do this? And here's the thing. You cannot make your kids believe anything. They have to decide for themselves. That's why we're so panicked, because we want it. Here's the real truth. We want it more than they want it. And that drives me crazy. I mean, it just sounds so stupid in the middle of an argument with your teenager. You go, if you just followed Jesus, all this wouldn't happen. <laughs> it sounds stupid, doesn't it? So, I mean, we just, it's just like, it just doesn't compute. It's like teenagers, they've got to figure it out for themselves. But how can we help? How can we partner with God, the Holy Spirit, to do something in our kids that's compelling? What do we do? Well, I want to take a look at what Jesus um, how Jesus was questioned and, and kind of some of his thoughts because I think it helps us a little bit. I'm going to draw some conclusions that will help you in your own relationship with God and it will help you with your kids. I promise you it will. If you don't have kids, it will help you with your friends or coworkers 
or, or your parents, people in your life that you want to see come to a vibrant faith in Jesus Christ that don't currently have that. So this will help you. Anyway, this is what we've tried to do, and we've failed at it so many times, but this is the deal. Here's what was happening. Jesus was doing his ministry, and when he was doing his ministry, those three years of his ministry, he really rocked the religious world. In fact, other religious powerhouse leaders of the day were bent on trapping Jesus in some her her heresy, which was a crime in Ju Judaism, and, and punishable by imprisonment or even death. And so they were trying to trap Jesus all the time in some heresy so they could get him off the scene because Jesus' story of grace, of forgiveness, of relationship totally uh, sort of um, uh, countered this legalistic uh, religion of Ju that Judaism had become. And, and the ideal here is that the people that were in power, if Jesus had his way, wouldn't be in power anymore, and everybody's fighting to keep power or get power. And so this group of people uh, named the Sadducees, they came to try to trap Jesus with some intellectual conversation. They were called the Sadducees. This was a group of people who did not believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in uh, uh, the resurrection, for example. That's why they were Sadducee. <laughs> Boo, 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 boo. That was good. Oh, you, you think you will use it. Somehow you will get into a conversation with somebody at work tomorrow about Sadducees. <laughs> Sadducee, yeah. Well, they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> okay. So that didn't work. Let's move on. It wasn't that funny. I'm trying to milk it because I think it's hilarious, actually. Okay, it's not. All right, so... The Sadducees didn't do it, so they turned it over to another group of religious leaders, the Pharisees. I don't have a joke about the Pharisees. <laughs> no, I wish I did. Pharisees. Anyway, and so that's where we pick up the story. We're going to pick it up in Matthew chapter 22. It's after the Sadducees were fa failed at trapping Jesus, but the Pharisees picked up the, the baton. Here's what it says. Ready? Here we go. Matthew chapter 22. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, he had shut them down, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer. Why is it always a lawyer? Why is the troublemaker always a lawyer? I know a few lawyers, and uh, this kind of makes sense now. Okay, so ask him a question to test him. Now, notice they were going to ask Jesus a question to test him. This is a very important point because oftentimes our children or we ask questions not for information or not for training or not for teaching, but we ask questions because we're either trying to prove our point or we're trying to get our way or we're trying to test the people that we're asking. And that's what was happening with these religious leaders, these people in power, okay? So they were asking a question to test him and they said this, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Which is the great commandment in the law? It really means, which is the greatest commandment? What's the top deal? What's the most important thing? This is it. And what the Pharisees hit on was something that you and I struggle with all the time. And I want you to connect with this because maybe you're not like me, or maybe you're not like the Pharisees, but most of us like to reduce relationships down to a to-do list. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were saying, which is the greatest law? Now, it's a no-win kind of question because whatever Jesus selected in terms of the law, he created a winner. This is the greatest law. And then he created losers. And when he created those losers, that's where the Pharisees could trap him in saying, aha, he doesn't believe in the Sabbath, for example, because he believes in this other thing. So there, that's heresy, and they would have arrested him. And that's what they were trying to do. And so Jesus could have picked a number of things. He could have picked the law of circumcision. He could have picked the law of the Sabbath. He could have picked the law of sacrifice. Which is the greatest law, Jesus? Is it the judicial law? Is it the ceremonial law? Is it the moral law? I mean, which law is it? And see, we do this. Here's the thing. What we want to do is reduce down, just tell me what you want me to do. Because somehow we think... If we just do the right things, we'll be the right people. And it doesn't work that way. This is the question. What do you want me to do? We ask this question to God. God, just tell me what you want me to do. Now, God has written a pretty 
exhaustive book here on some things that you could be doing, but we'd say, well, that's too much, so just tell me the most important things. I can't do everything. God doesn't expect me to do everything, right? So what is the one thing? What's the most important thing? What do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want me to do. Now, here's the question. That, that question or the answer to this question may be helpful in all your relationships at some point time, some bit of time. But this is not the question that builds intimacy in your relationship. We cannot reduce like a marriage relationship or a parenting child, parent child relationship down to a bunch of robotic actions. Just tell me what to do. Oh, you want to know what to do? Now it is helpful in that moment, you know, like just, I've had that fight, that passionate fight. I told you last week, I'm kind of a screamer. So I've, I've had that fight with, uh, with my wife, you know, just tell me what you want me to do because I'm so confused, you know. Just tell me what to do. And she'll say, well, start with, stop being a jerk, okay? <laughs> okay, well, that's not fair. And uh, I'm not sure I can stop that, you know, that kind of deal. Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And, and here's the thing. If you've been married as long as I have or as long as Karen and Ed Vaughn, this, this is a trap because... Even if it worked, guys, listen, this is a trap. Don't use this. Don't go to your wife and say, well, just tell me what you want me to do. Because they'll tell you. <laughs> and here's what you'll believe. You believe now you have the answer. And you'll live out the answer. And you'll keep doing it. And you don't recognize that the answer changes all the time. <laughs> and then you have the next fight. And you say, well, what are you doing? You told me to do this, and that's what I'm doing what do you want me to do now? And then it's another thing. So the thing that you were doing, it doesn't work anymore. Is this just my marriage? or Because I feel very alone here. Maybe some people in Missouri City get this. This is not a good relationship building question. And it's not a good way to invest in your kids. Here's why. When we reduce a relationship with God down to actions then we can get our kids to do certain things, but that doesn't mean they have the heart for God that you're hoping that they'll have. We can get them to care about the poor. Actually, we can't get them to care about the poor, but we can get them to serve the poor. We can get them to pick up the room. We can get them to do certain things. We can get them to come to church. We can get them to open their Bible. We can force them. We can force them. This is what good Christians do. This is the question of church. Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And then we think if we do it, we're right with God. And Jesus had a completely different ideal here. That's what the Pharisees were saying. This is where the Pharisees were good. This is where you and I are good. Because we figure out what we think is important to God And we get good at it, and then we try to get other people in our world to do the thing that we think is important to God. This is the most important thing. And whole denominations around the world are created by different people who select certain laws and rituals and traditions that they think are the most important thing. And they gather together in churches around this thing, and they try to get everybody in the world to do the thing that they think is most important, and then they judge the people outside of the church, who don't buy that this is the most important thing. And that's where you have all this friction in the Christian faith and all around the world. So this isn't a good question. What do you want me to do? Here's how Jesus answered that question. What do you want me to do? A simple question. Just tell me which law. Just tell me which one it is. That's, that's all they're asking. Here's what he answers. Well, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, With all of your mind, this is the great and first commandment. It's like, just tell me what to do. Oh, you want to know what to do? Here's what you do. You shall love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with everything you have. No, 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 one thing. (laughs) Just tell me one thing. Oh, you want just one thing to do? Here's what you do. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. So when you go to God and say, God, just tell me, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything you want me to do. Go to Matthew chapter 22 and read this. Because your question, here's your question. What do you want me to do in light of our marriage problem? What do you want me to do in light of our financial problem? What do you want me to do in light of the doctor's report? What do you want me to do in, because of my rebellious children? What do you want me to do? Just tell me what you do and I'll do it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. 
with all your might. That's what he wants you to do. But I don't want to do that. I want a cause and effect relationship. If I be good, you be good. That's the way it works, right, God? I come to church. I give a little money. I volunteer my time. It puts God in a leveraged position where he owes me. Who's in control of that relationship? You are. You're in control. You did your part. Now it's God's turn to do his part. And if you've ever been angry at God, which I've been angry at God a whole lot of times, because God did not come through for you, it's because you did what you thought he wanted you to do, but now he's not doing what you want him to do. You're going, well, what good is this thing? I've had people, what good is Christianity? I prayed like crazy and my mom still died. What good is this? And what the Pharisees wanted was that same idea. You tell me what to do. And they were really good about keeping the rules. That's why they were Pharisees. I mean, they, they were devout. I mean, they, they did it all. I mean, when you talked about righteousness, you thought about the Pharisees. I mean, they were the modern, uh, the ancient day deacon. I mean, they were the ones that were supposed to be straight laced, all right? They're the ones that lied about their drinking. All those people. It's a deacon joke. Sorry. And so that's the deal. And, and Jesus turned them on their ear and said, here, bring it back up. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So let's combine these two ideas. What do you want me to do? Let's read it out loud. Ready? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Did I mess that up? Yeah, I think I did. Okay, let's try it again. Sorry, I didn't divide this right. What do you want me to do? Let's read it out loud. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. I don't want to do that. That's right. <laughs> Jesus took a religious question and he turned it into a relational problem. He took this religious question. How do I be righteous? Tell me how to be a good person. How, do I, how, do I, how am I in? And Jesus said, oh, you want to do Here's the deal. Love God with everything you have. Now, it would be somewhat helpful if we were to say, well, here's what he meant by the heart. And here's what he meant by the soul. And here's what he meant by the mind. But it's really meant to go together. This is a holistic view. In other words, in Jewish life, your relationship with God, if you were Jewish and Orthodox and you understood what was going on, you would not fragment your relationship with God to some piece of the weekend that you celebrated him. A relationship with God was holistic. It affected your calendar. It affected your priorities. It affected what you did in the morning. It affected how you went to bed. It affected what day you took off. It affected your diet. No shellfish. No pork. It was the lens of which you looked through everything in life. It wasn't some sort of Sunday come to religion experience where you showed up for a piece and said, look, I'm a Christian and I'm well balanced because I got my Christian part, I got my vocational part, I got my domestic part, I got my hobbies, I got the secret part over here <laughs> nobody knows about, but it bumps right up against um, church on Sunday, so it's perfect, you know, and I do that thing and then I do this thing and now I'm balanced. That's fragmented. And what Jesus was saying is, no, this relationship with Jesus Christ that you say you want, here's the idea. It's the lens of which you look at every other relationship and every other thing in your life. It's not part of who you are. It's the thing that you look through for everything else in your life. This is what Jesus was saying. This is a bigger problem. Just tell me what to do turns into surrender. Just tell me what you want me to do. Give everything you know that you are to God. That's what it turns into. No, I don't want that. Stay away from my heart. Stay away from my passions. Stay away from my desires. Stay away from my goals and my ambitions. Those are my, just tell me what you want me to do. Because I can do what you want me to do without having a good heart about it. But I cannot have a good heart and not do the good you want me to do. See how that works? There's a lot of people that show up here, I know it's hard for you to believe, and their heart's not in it. There's been several weeks I showed up here, <laughs> and my heart's not in it. So you can fake it. And God's going, no, there's no place for fake it. So here's the idea. Have a holistic approach. If you want your kids to catch this, you cannot have a fragmented life. Because here's what your kids see. Here's what your kids see. 
Okay, everybody, act normal. Okay, no, 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 stop acting normal. We're going to church. Here we go. Act like a Christian. Sing the songs. Raise your hand. It's great. Talk in Christianese. Everybody you see, call them a brother or sister. When you get the chance, talk, say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. And then throw in God is good. And you have the language down. And you have the vocabulary down. And you teach your kids this. And then they go off to their regular life and their school life. And it's a fragmented piece of their life that's absolutely disconnected with every other piece of their life. It's so confusing for children. It just doesn't work. Here's the truth. They're not buying it. The reason our children don't want to follow Christ is because it's not compelling in your life. It's just a piece of your life. And they misinterpret that piece to being just be a good person. And they'll try to be a good person. But this heart issue that Jesus was talking about is a holistic thing. It's something that he's asking you to do that's holistic. To surrender every piece of your life to him. Your finances, your future, your goals, your career, your children. Everything. It's a... It's a surrendered life. It's holistic. And you don't like, okay, it's Sunday, so now we're going to think like a Christian. It's, I'm a follower of Christ, and everything that I look at is impacted by that view. And if you don't have that, right, if there's this fragment, fragmented life, then what happens is your kids get confused, and they say things like, well, you know, it wasn't real for them. It's just... And what they say is, oh, you want me to be a churchgoer? Okay, I'll be a churchgoer. And we've been around as a church long enough now, 18 years, where we've seen parents and kids come to church. They come to church on a real sporadic basis. It's not this holistic thing. And when the kids get old enough, they quit finding a good reason to come because mom and dad wanting you to come isn't compelling anymore. And there's no internal motivation to come and to learn about a relationship with Jesus Christ or to learn what a relationship is all about because I was just coming because mom and dad said that's what good people do. And that goes away in college. Some of you haven't been back to church since college. And you came to River Point. And we're glad you're here. And you're trying to figure out, is this compelling? Does this mean anything? You see, when Jesus... Um, said this thing, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When he said that, this was not new to the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees knew the Bible better than any other group in Judaism. This wasn't a new thing like, like people were going, whoa, that's amazing. I never heard that. Boy, he got them. Jesus was quoting the Old Testament when he said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, oh, you want to know the greatest commandment? It's been there all along, right in front of your face. It's from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe, it says this. Hear, O Israel, see if this doesn't look familiar. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And then he says, you want to invest in your children? You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them while you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as signs on your hand and they shall be as front, what's that? Frontlets? Is that a word? Between your eyes. I don't know what version that is. I've never seen that word before. I think people back in the back are jacking with me right here. So <laughs> they are. They're totally jacking with me. That's not, I just create a word. It'll freak him out. You know, so frontlets. <laughs> have y'all ever seen that word before? You have. What's it mean? Oh, right here on the front. Oh, I knew that. I was just testing. Yeah. 
As soon as I started, this lady back here is Googling. Oh, you know, <laughs> it means this. Okay, here we go. So the, the ideal here, have I mentioned that I have ADD real bad? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Teach them diligently to your children ta- and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way. I mean, here's what. From a very early age, every single one of those Pharisees heard this twice a day, morning and evening. It was called the Shema. And it, that's a Hebrew word that means listen. Hear, O Israel, is the first word. That, that's where it comes from, the Shema. Say the Shema. Ready? The Shema. Now you'll be able to talk Hebrew, okay, when you go out of here. Sadducees and Shema. You're going to really impress the people at work this week, okay? It's the Shema. And this Shema was part of the religion and the, and the ritual of Jewish life. Every morning, every evening, they would pray this prayer. They would say it out loud. So when Jesus recited it, you know, uh, about probably 750 to 1,500 years later, from when, when this was, probably not that long, probably about 800 years later, then, then this wasn't new. But here's the idea. The idea is right in front of them the whole time, and they didn't get it. Now, I wonder what that's like for us. It's like right in front of us the whole time, but we just don't get it. What does God want me to do? Here's what I want to do. I want to reduce this down to behaviors, and God wants to deal with my heart. Now, I don't want God messing with my heart. My, I got a plan. I need God's power to empower my plan, but I got a plan, okay? And so I don't want God screwing around with my plan, but I'll do what he wants me to do. I'll be the robot, program the computer, and I'll live out your orders. And God wants relationship. He wants you to know him and his goodness, and he wants you to know him in an intimate way, and he wants to know you. He wants you to exercise your free will to surrender your life to him in a powerful, relevant, real way. He doesn't need your behaviors. He doesn't need you to be a good boy or good girl. He wants your heart. The only thing he can't take from you is your heart. It's the only thing you got that you have to surrender. And we reduce this down to this load of crap of doing good stuff. Just I'm a good person so I can sleep at night and feel like I'm better than somebody or feel like I'm good enough. And Jesus is saying that's pharisaical. It's not about that. It's about surrendering your life in such a way that he grabs a hold of your heart and changes the trajectory of your entire life because he's controlling you by your passions and your desires and your will. And he wants you to surrender that to him. Here's the hard truth. If you don't get that, and you don't have to get it completely, but partially, your kids will not buy it because they're looking for what your heart is about, not what your actions are about. And they're going to buy your values, not your behaviors. This is it. You know, if you want to teach them, here's what's implied here. I'm making this stuff up now, but time. You've got to spend time with your kids so they can catch your heart. And we live in an age and a culture that is so messed up on time. I mean, I know that from a church because I say, hey, what about being in a small group or what about volunteer? What about doing this? Here's what you say. You say, when, when do I have time for that? That's what you're saying right now. When, when, now. when would I have time for that? Is anybody in here have extra time, because I'd like to borrow it. Maybe somebody down in Missouri City. You have some extra time down there. Is somebody down there bored? And the devil, the devil's not trying to tempt your kids with evil. He's trying to keep you and your family so stinking busy, you don't have time to connect. You're over there praying, oh, God, keep them away from the potheads, and God, keep them away from this, and keep... The devil is not about all that only. If he can keep you playing baseball year-round and traveling and doing all this other stuff, now I'm getting personal, I'm so sorry. 
If he can get you playing club sports all the time. Just busy, 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 busy. I keep Whataburger busy. I don't have time to stop and eat. I'm going through the drive-thru. My goal is not to actually come to a complete stop. <laughs> just real slow. Just here's the payment. And you grab it. You grab it right back here. Right here. So, thank you. And then you go to the next window. If, if they're using a two-window system, which they hardly ever do. Go there. Give me the food, 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 food. <laughs> and you're off. I had four kids. It was like Vietnam at my house. We had to fight to have a dinner uh, a table, I mean, a dinner around the table. It didn't come out of a bag. That's where we live. Because somehow we think all the activity that we're doing is better than being together. We're so scared to be bored, it's so irresponsible. When my kids got in high school, we instituted this thing that everybody in my family but me hated. We called it No Media Monday. And they hated it. My wife hated it. Uh, her favorite shows were on Monday nights. And I said, that's it. No media Monday. We're unplugging. Mondays. No TV. No headphones. You can listen to music, but you got to put it through your... Everybody's got to listen to it. And we'll start a dance party. Because <laughs> I'm going to experience what you're experiencing. No media Monday. You can have friends over, but you got to hang out. We're going to hang out. He, I'm telling you, man. Yeah, well, and now, Lisa put up a good front in front of the kids. Yes, I think this is really important, but behind the scenes, I'm like, well, when they go to bed, can we cheat? No, we're not <laughs> cheating. I think, it, I think it really was the single best thing we did as a family because we had to talk. We had to deal with our boredom. We created so many games, stupid idiotic games. I think it was during a No Media Monday that we learned how to do a family pyramid. Human pyramid. <laughs> so fun. We invented like 50 or 60 different ways to hug. Such a dumb thing. <laughs> we invented this game called Cops. I've told you about it before where just obnoxious game. Hide and seek. Stupid stuff totally connected our family. And as long as I'm hypnotized by the game on the, on the Monday Night Football or whatever it is, I don't have to have a conversation with the people in my house. And it will ruin you. Time. It requires time. So let me ask you, if you want to really invest in your children, no matter how old they are, where are you spending that time just being together? One of the best investments I made in my family is I built a fire pit. I built this fire pit, and man, it's obnoxious. I can, build, I can burn like a half a quart of wood at one time. I mean, it's, it's enormous. I'm sure I'm breaking some city code. I mean, it's just amazing. It's gotten so hot before that the concrete and the fire bricks have cracked. <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> I am a man. And we're just now getting into fire season. And we just, man, we get a fire and we sit around. Catch this. And we talk. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. We spit, too. We throw things at each other. One time I almost lit... Our palm tree on fire by accident. I mean, but we do other things, but time. And here's the last thing I'll tell you. If you want to invest in your kids, is you're going to have to teach them the truth. You're going to have to, here, here, no, I didn't say that quite right. Here's what I'm trying, here's somehow, I blame myself. I think this is where I failed. Because I'm a pastor. I didn't want to send my kids to private school, Christian school, and I, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to overload my kids with Jesus, Jesus, every environment they were in. So, and, and, and I'm glad we made some of those choices, but somehow I went light on the conversations about where to find truth. I regret that a whole lot. I don't, I don't know that my children have a full appreciation for the Bible. 
I'm not saying you teach the Bible so they know the Bible. Here's the only lesson I want my kids to know. This is true, and it's the authority for our life. That's the only truth I'd want them to know. Because I want them to seek out God's truth for what is true about me. Because if you don't have a source of truth that's outside of you, then you'll come up with your own silly stuff about you. Well, this is true about me because this is the way I feel. No, why don't we look together? This is what's true about me. This is what's true about God. And if you don't respect this as the authority in your life, then you're going to make up all kinds of things about God that sound good and Oprah tells you about, but it may not be true. Sorry, I was a little hard on Oprah there. God wants to tell you not only about truth about him, he wants to tell you about truth about the world you're living in. He wants to tell you the truth about your future. And this book, I don't understand it all. I don't know it all. But I know this one thing. It is the absolute authority for my life. And what it says, even when I'm disobedient, even when I choose to not believe it, even when I choose not to read it, it doesn't change. It is the authority. It is the power. It controls truth. It is the truth. It contains the truth. I just want my kids to grow up and go, man, I don't know anything about anything but this. My dad told me the Bible was true. That's what I want them to know. I failed in that area somewhere. I don't think they get that. The culture and the truth the culture is telling them is more compelling at times. Now, it's early in the race with my kids, so I'm not giving up on anybody. But I'm just saying the culture is such a powerful voice in your kid's life. And they're telling them all kinds of things is true that are not true. And they're going to have to decide. And if you'll do nothing else, I'm not saying, okay, do a Bible study with your kids. That would be great. But that's, that's for overachievers. Here's all you do. Once a week, once a week, get your Bible out. And get your kids around. That's all you got to do. And say, kids, this is the Bible. It's made up of two parts, the Old and the New Testament. Every word in this book is true. Now, I don't understand it all. I don't even believe it all. And I'm certainly not living it all. But I want you to know this book is true. This is it. And if you'll just do that once a week, it takes like, what did that take? 45 seconds? Sit it down, eat your nachos, you're great, okay? Just do that on a regular basis. Hey, kids. And they'll start going, oh my God, here we go, the Bible speech. You go, that's right, Bible speech. Let me just tell you, this is the Bible. It's made up of two parts, Old and New Testament. Every word in this Bible is true. Now, I don't believe it all. I'm not living it all out. But I want you to know it's all true. This is the source of truth. Okay, let's eat our tacos. Here we go. If you'll just do that, and I did not do that, I, I promise you, your kid at one time without you is going to go, God, I don't even know what to do. Well, I just want to know what's right. I just want to know what's true. Bing. What? Oh my gosh. And you have a chance. I didn't do that very well. I wish I'd done that better. You got to have a holistic approach. You got to spend time with your kids. And you got to show them where the truth is. And if you'll do that, and that's just not with your kids, but with other people. This is it. You'll make a huge impact in their life. I've rambled on so much. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for loving us, for the truth that we don't even know. It's right here. Golly, it's amazing. And I just pray for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, for a legacy that we start in this generation where we will have a holistic view of a relationship with you that impacts every other part of our life. And that we will spend time that our kids won't remember one single gift we give them, but they'll remember every laugh, every story, every dumb thing we talked about, 
every time we were together. And I pray that my kids, as well as every kid that's represented here, will grow up to grab a hold of a Bible and say, man, I don't know what's in here. I just have been told it's all true. And I pray, oh God, that that would make a huge difference in our families. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you've been challenged by this sermon today. Maybe you got some questions about that. Maybe you got some questions about your faith or, or about our church. My information is on the screen. I would love to connect with you. Um, if you haven't had a chance to fill out that welcome card, I would love for you to do that. Have a great week. God bless you. Hugs and fist pounds all around. And we'll see you soon on Riverpoint.tv. Oh, 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 oh,